Watch the entire video my lovely viewers, I mean from start to finish, to get the whole thing. Without wasting much of your time, let's get right into it. Hi lovely viewers, it's me again, your one and only Mtati Mpundu. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time on my channel, kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel by hitting the red subscribe button down below and turn the bell icon to join the notification squad. Don't forget to like, share and leave a comment. Tell me what you think about this video in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you lovely viewers. Good day and welcome to today's conversation. Today we are privileged to host an academic you know, a publisher, an author, lecturer, but is well known as uh, advisor to uh, now a former president. I would like to introduce you to Chris Zumani Zimba. Dr. Zimba, welcome to today's program. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be on this conversation and I, I look forward to, to having a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Many people know you that you're a special assistant to the president at State House. You were serving President Edgar Lungu as an advisor on politics. But who is Chris Zuman Zimba? Okay, thank you. Uh, to start with, I'm um, a Zambian citizen, born from the late Mr. Frederick Buonari Zimba, mm. who was uh, from partially from uh, uh, Marambo and also Chipata. My grandfather came from... Uh, Manambo, he was Bisa, and my grandfather from my father's side was Ngoni from Chipata, Chief Kapatamoyo. Mm. So my late father, uh, Frederick Bwanadi Zimba, spent much of his life, I think, with his mother in Chipata. So, uh, and that's where I met my mother. Uh, she, she's a late now, she's uh, Ngoni Chewa. Both her parents came from Chief Kapatamoyo around Chipata. And the two, as a couple, had ten children, and Chris Manzimba is number eight in a family <laughs> of ten. Wow, you're a yeah. large family. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know those days our parents who love large families. Exactly. From one woman, huh? From one twelve woman. children, yeah, ten children, exactly. and you're number eight. <laughs> yeah. Tell us briefly just about uh, your school and professional life. Okay, thank you. So I, I spent my childhood life in Chipata. That's where my mom and dad lived after my father retired from Dollar, where he worked as a pharmacist. So I did my grade one to grade nine at uh, Monoro Basic School. Monoro Basic School is a village school in Chief Kapatamoyo, in Chipata Ruro, 10 miles from Chipata Boma. So I lived much of my childhood life there until grade nine. When I passed to grade 10, I crossed over to come to Lusaka, where I joined my auntie. She was a mentor at Evelyn Horn College. Yeah. So I did my grade 10 to grade 12 at Lotus Basic School here in Lusaka. And uh, after I finished, I, by God's grace, I passed very well. I was yes. among the best students at Lotus. Wow. I had wanted to do law. That was my passion in high school or some form of the diplomacy. So I wanted something with legal issues or diplomacy. I ended up studying legal studies for a year or two years at Ivarin Horn, a distance program. Well, in second year, I was admitted to go to the University of Zambia in the School of so Humanities and Social Sciences. When I reached UNSA, that's when I discovered there's a program called Political Science in my yes. first year. And I was fascinated and I became interested. And I think that's why I abandoned everything I dreamt of doing in my life, whether diplomacy, whether law. And I thought political science was what would suit my passion and my interest. And I did political science. I minored in public administration for years at the University of Zambia uh, between 2004 to 2007. Yes. And uh, after I left UNSA, I went, at, I, I, of course, when I was at the University of Zambia, I was working for NGOs. I was a very vibrant and active member in the youth movement. Mm. We had the Youth Forum Zambia then. I was the Secretary General of Youth Forum Zambia, a consortium of 
youth NGOs. Oh, youth organizations, exactly, yes. Exactly, exactly. So at the University of Zambia, I had a group of friends who were also running an NGO. So I was a student as well as a youth activist. So that gave me some opportunity also to work actively in the youth movement. So I traveled across Zambia uh, on youth-funded projects, funded, funded either by USAID, funded by UNAIDS, SAT, and different donors. Because at the time, I think there was um, the, the, HIV, the, yeah. the, the HIV pandemic. Exactly, now, I think there exactly. Were a lot exactly, of efforts. Exactly. To... So I was one of those active and vibrant youths that were everywhere across the country to try to help other young Zambians in the fight against HIV and AIDS through my, uh, the NGO I belong to, Youth Change Movement. But at the same time, I was a, a student at the University of Zambia. When I left the University of Zambia, I was given a full-time job by Youth Forum Zambia. We had been funded by then the Swedish government to implement HIV prevention and the advocacy programs across the country. So the donors, the Swedish government, as well as the share two under USAID, gave the condition that they needed somebody who was educated to become a full-time national coordinator. So I was employed as a national coordinator for Youth Forum Zambia. Okay. And the way I worked for a year, almost going to second year. In 2008, uh, the, government, the Zambian government, through PSMD, uh, employed us as political scientists then, who had graduated from the University of Zambia. Not that we had applied, but that we were headhunted. Okay, okay. The late President Mwanawansa, before he died, I believe that he had been left a directive that whoever was supposed to be employed as a political secretary at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was supposed to have been a political scientist. So by then, Zambia didn't have a lot of political scientists. True. <laughs> so they went to the University of Zambia to inquire how many political scientists had graduated in 2006-07 or so, and were the only the three of us. Mm. So they gave them my number, plus my two colleagues. That's how we were appointed. So I left the NGO out to join civil service. So from 2009, to 2010, early 2010, I worked at Foreign Affairs as a political secretary. I enjoyed my job there, but uh, I believe that I was an activist, yeah, an <laughs> not activist a civil servant. servant. <laughs> <laughs> so I resigned. Yes. The PS Ambassador Kapoma was very much shocked. He was not happy about it. Because you we were just me. being groomed. Exactly, and, and, and they and thought there was a lot of potential mm. uh, to work at Foreign Affairs and to, in the civil service, but I said no. I wanted to publish books, political books, and the Public Service Code of Conduct couldn't allow a civil servant to be publishing political books. I started writing political articles, so the condition was I was supposed to hold on until I retire. That's when I can publish them, but I said, no, mm. I will just resign mm. so that I do what I enjoy. Yes, That's how yes. I resigned. In 2010 to 2012, I went to, the, to, to Germany. I won a scholarship, a DAAD scholarship. Mm -hmm to do my a master's program in democratic governance and uh, public policy. So I was in Germany for two years and uh, six months. I did my master's there for two years. As I said, I, I specialized in democratic governance and public policy. Yeah. And when I came back, I didn't go back to the civil service because I had resigned. I started lecturing at the University of Zambia part-time, as well as lecturing at the University of Lusaka part-time. Full-time, I had the uh, a job with some two USAID projects. Chair two employed me as a, a, poli, a policy and advocacy expert or consultant or specialist uh, between 2013 and 2015. When I left the uh, Chair two project under USAID, I joined the uh, uh, Plan International. They yes. had a Zichi project, also an HIV project, where I was the cultural and policy uh, advisor for the project until 2018. Mm. So between 2013 and 2018, I worked full time for two different USAID projects, but I was also lecturing actively at the University of Zambia and the mm. University of Lusaka. Mm. So during the period I was also working and lecturing, I started doing my PhD, mm. where I, spent, I was doing comparative political systems at the University of Lusaka. The Western Democratic political system versus the African traditional political system. So mm -hmm. I was looking at the 
the Ngoni Kingdom, specifically three chiefdoms of Kapata Moyo, Nzamane, and... You went back home. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> to look at what are the threats, what are the opportunities, as well as the, yeah, many of the, 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 the challenges and opportunities that are existing, that exist in a traditional political system with regards to democracy promotion. So I graduated in 20... What are your views? You know, we have had... Um, uh, now democracy, exactly. but first we're essentially a multi-party state at independence, we went socialist, we are now like liberal capitalist, but all these, all these systems appear to fail, and I'm glad that you took some studies mm, relating exactly, to exactly, exactly. Uh, those systems. Is it fair that we abandoned our governance systems as Africans? No, I think the, there was no study that informed the decision to completely abandon uh, an Afri the African traditional system or model of governance to the Western vision. There was some form of a regional political protest or revolution in the mm -hmm. 90s or mm -hmm. late 1980s. There was the, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, yes. there was some, what could be deemed as a triumph of democracy, Western democracy at global level. Mm -hmm. And Africa was one of the regions that was not, well, that was significantly influenced by the triumph of Western democracy following the collapse of socialism and the mm -hmm. Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what informed basically the abandonment, complete abandonment to any form of African other. political mm -hmm. systems or other political models or political systems. To say the truth in terms of empirical data, you will need a hybrid. Mm -hmm. Both the democracy has its own merits and its own strength. Mm -hmm. And the African traditional systems or models have got their own strength and their own merits. So what we need at some point is to begin to debate and discuss about a hybrid version. Mm -hmm. As you have noticed, from, 20, from 1998, when multi-party democracy dawned Africa at a larger scale, uh, there is very little we can talk about in terms of achievement. Mm -hmm. in terms of development and progress African countries have made. Mm -hmm. Talk from Cairo, from Cairo, Cape Town, to Dar es Salaam, to Accra, Lusaka, Lilongwe, mm -hmm. uh, Kinshasa. You can go to different capital cities of Africa where multi-party democracy has been piloted for more than 20 years, more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. Still, there is very little we can talk about. And to some extent, multi-party democracy has fragmented and divided many Nations. African countries. Mm, mm. As we speak today, some African countries are on fire. They are in some form of political uh, divisions and bloodshed in some countries, even civil wars. Mm. But these are the countries that are at some point at least not quite democracy. We've seen <laughs> the choices of political parties as entrenched now regionalism exactly, to some extent exactly, even tribalism. Exactly, exactly. You see that the PF, for example, is strong in the north and east, and the UPND is strong in the south and west. So I think there are these negatives that exactly. democracy, exactly. A type of democracy, brings to Africa. Exactly. Because there's a tendency for people to regress to their tribes, their, to, to march your political support. Exactly. And then you have a splinter of regional politics. Mm, mm. Mm. So there is need, I think, to create a balance, especially for people in academics and research that he, as the, we talk about constitutional reforms in Africa, they are supposed to be informed by research. Uh, my PhD focus or thematic area reviewed a lot of um, ingredients in terms of what we need to look for when you're designing political what systems. What are those, briefly? Yeah. For example, in the African governance systems, how did they achieve consensus? How did they achieve community development? How did they exactly. achieve... So I'll give you an example in terms of um, what happened during colonialism. <clears throat> Many African countries were, um, uh, you know, subdivided into provinces and districts and constituencies. The criteria the colonialists were using and the post-colonialist governments were using is literally either rivers, hills, <laughs> mm. physical features at some yes, point. Yes. But Africa already existed in form of physical boundaries that were in form of villages and chiefdoms and kingdoms. So those boundaries were abandoned. So the challenge we have, for example, today is that we have got a constituency 
in a modern democratic state that is encompassing maybe three or four chief bombs. But these chief bombs already had their own boundaries. Yeah. So what is happening today is that if you are going to talk about political governance and development in this constituency, it goes at some point in conflict with the boundaries of the chiefdom that existed. So you maybe you bring three or four chiefdoms that never coexisted before, before colonialism. You bring them under one. So even when you talk about uh, development, you'd find that when you vote for an M when you elect an MB from this chiefdom, mm, mm. the other chiefdoms will you have complain. some form of some protest. Mm. So a, a harmonious and a natural way to have approach these issues could have been to take into a, a, a account traditional structures that existed before colonialism and yeah. before independence. So that when you begin to talk about constituencies, talking about constituencies of people a bit homogeneous in terms of ethnicity and history. Yeah. Uh, so you can still talk about democracy in a modern context while recognizing what existed before. before. The best example has always been Gawaundi, whose people are, are spread across three countries. Exactly. So you have the Chewas now. Now they are Mozambicans. Now they are Zambians. Malawians. Now they are Malawians. Yeah. Uh, and that illustrates your point exactly, very clearly. Exactly, exactly. That uh, these guys were just using a ruler <laughs> yes. you see, to divide <laughs> countries and peoples yeah. with ramifications that have mm. faced us for mm. centuries. Mm. You came to my attention, I would confess, when you wrote a stinging Article because you are an author, you are yes, author of yes, many books, yes, and we we'll yes. talk about them. But a, a book was, a, I mean, an article on social media was sent to me for me to attempt to respond. You had this article was a Christian nation in a brothel state for drunkards, superstitious, <laughs> and corrupt citizens. It was literally an attack on what President Edgar Lungu was doing at the time. He had declared. Um, I think October 18th as a day of national prayer and fasting. And um, what, what motivated such a stinging attack on the Christian nation? Okay, thank you. So sometimes as a political scientist, you're a political philosopher. Yeah. So you come up with the political themes that are designed to steer societal and national debate. So for me, it was a very provocative article and consequently book that was designed to allow Zambians to begin to scrutinize and discuss and debate critically the issue of the Christian declaration. Mm. By the way, I'm a full-time born-again Christian. Yeah. I need to put it on record. So yes. when I write certain things, I do not demean Christianity. I'm a believer of Jesus Christ, mm. and I'm a promoter and a crusader yeah. of the gospel. Yes. That has to be made very clear. But as I said, by virtue of my profession, I'm a political philosopher. So I should be able to write things at some point that attract and provoke national interest and debate. Mm. The article and consequently the book you're talking about was one of such. Ah, okay. <laughs> exactly, okay. yes. I think that then, you know, people need to understand that you're a political scientist. Exactly, yes. And you write provocative things. Exactly, yes. You know, um, when you were arrested, I linked your earlier write-up, criticism of mm. President Akainde um, uh, uh, pronouncement to your arrest. Exactly. It was very exactly. simple. Exactly. They didn't understand you. No. They didn't understand that you've provided very stinging criticism uh, to heads of state, to government, exactly. to policy exactly. decisions. Mm. You are not being malicious no, on President no, Akainde no. Ichilema. But before we come to that, let's come to you, you coming to State House. How did that happen? We had um, Kaiser Zulu, I think, uh, is a figure to love and a figure to hate. And there was this huge debate, demands for President mm. um, Edgar Lungu to fire Kaiser Zulu. And when people had thought Kaiser Zulu would not be released, we just saw an announcement that you were the new special assistant to the president. And you, you will advise the president on politics. How did that happen? Okay, thank you. So what happens is that he, the president is informed by the system many times and always. That's ideal in every country. 
So I was one of the few on the blessed as well as privileged Zambians who came to the attention to the knowledge of the former president by virtue of what I was doing out there and by virtue of my profession. I was just called to go to State House by then in the Secretary of the Cabinet. And when I engaged him... Dr. Simon met you. Exactly. When I engaged him, he availed to me the idea that the president had decided to work with me under his office to handle the political side of the presidency. And of course, by virtue of my profession and my passion for work for the Zambian people, that was it. And 14 hours, I was sworn in. I was appointed on merit and merit and merit. Did you know President Lungu before that? I had only met him before my appointment two months earlier when I was a consultant for the party. <clears throat> so I went to present a report before Central Committee. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I was meeting President Lungu at State House in October 2019. Mm -hmm. And I made my presentation as a PF consultant, political consultant. Yeah. And I think that also had got his attention. Two months later, I was appointed. But I think it is the work of what he wanted. Yeah. I came to learn that he had decided to work with a professional political scientist. Okay. So he wanted somebody who is competent and somebody who is qualified. Somebody who tell him the truth and not hide. Somebody who is not going to put mm -hmm. But work as a professional person, just like mm -hmm. a president would single-handed in point somebody to work as his personal doctor or his personal lawyer. So I was uh, privileged as a young Zambian to have been appointed on merit of what I brought to the table as his political advisor. And even when I met him the first time, the second day, he, gave me, he walked me through mm. a conversation mm. to make me say to that he, he wanted the best of my professional son's point of view. Yeah to help his office because 2021 was coming and he didn't want mediocrity, he wanted professionalism and serious work. So from the way to go, it was serious work for me. It was professionalism. It was doing my best for the president and the people of Zambia. Was he accommodating to your ideas? He's one of the best employers I've ever worked for. Because as I indicated, I worked for different institutions yes. before, 20, before I was appointed. I worked in the NGO sector, local NGOs, where I was a national coordinator somewhere. I worked for two different USAID projects at national level. I worked in the universities as an academician. So I mean I had this exposure to different supervisors and different employers. Working with a president and for a president is not an easy mm. task. Mm. You are working for the most powerful person in the country. True. You are working for somebody who can hire and fire within seconds. But he, he is so fathery, if mm. I was to describe him in that way. Mm. He gave me a fatherly touch. But above all, he gave me a professional touch. He respected my professional input mm. to the president's from my point of view as a political scientist. Mm. He allowed Yufri, me to... What were, what were your roles? Yeah, so as a, political, as a political advisor to the president, your job is to analyze political dynamics, both national, regional, and international, and inform the president in terms of what could be the possible policy options the president and his government may take. So it is not a, a job of running a political party, as some people would want to, pay, to take it. It's yeah. like you are the SG of the mm, party of the Secretary and the State House. Of the yes. a, a yeah. State House. No. Mm. It is literally studying political dynamics at national level, on a daily basis, mm. regional level and international level. As you know that the political office of the president is the, pol is the office that establishes the presidency mm. because it's elected through a political vote. Yes. And he remains in State House as a politician. So it is the most important office to a president. So you, your day-to-day -day job is to bring recommendations, to bring policy options and uh, alternatives on a different national political issues, as well as regional and international dynamics, as they relate to the government of the Republic of Zambia. You are working in this office. Uh, president Nungu has been president, I think, for about five years since exactly, 2015. Yes, exactly. 
uh, he has the Patriotic Front as you know as a ruling party and is running government mm. projects. Mm. What was the state you founded in and where you thought you could improve the country? Because remember, the calendar of his presence was coming to an end in two years' time. Yes. How did you find the state of the party and then make it ready for the 2021 elections? Okay, so the, the, the issue is that uh, my focus was literally for 2021, August, because it was a situation of focusing on winning the game. As you have rightly indicated, time was running. I only took active office life in January 2020. So I had literally one year and maybe six months or so or less because we had an election coming. So our primary focus was to help the president defend the power. So we needed to work on a daily basis in terms of what could be the right and the positive political narratives. We needed to improve and increase and multiply the positive political narratives. We needed to improve and magnify the positive presidential image because we are preparing to package him to be on the ballot. Mm. So we had to, forgo, to forget and the, begin to overlook what had happened before I was appointed and try to magnify and run very fast on our base to increase positive public visibility from the presidential point of view, but also the president, to help the president help the SG, mm. because the president then not run the party, it's the SG. So they pray to help the president to help the SG in order for the SG to also up his game in terms of institutionalizing the party, mobilizing the party, but above all, managing the party members or cadres. Because mm. at that particular time, in 2020, the major complaint we were getting from the public was cadarism. Cadarism mm. and cadarism mm. and violent one cadarism. Year exactly. So that was one of the constant negative feedback we are getting in terms of the PF branding and the PF image a year or two years before elections. And we, we were also working, my job was to, at some point, uh, engage the SG so that he's able to help the president in running the party in the way the president wanted it to run, mm. to improve its positive posture and positive image. Mm. So there were a lot of activities on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis. We were running under my office to support the president, because he's also a party president anyway. Yes. But also to work with him as a Republican president, because there are also sector issues uh, uh, under his government that were also emerging and that were also threatening uh, his re-election. His re-election. So my office had to constantly balance, work with the government, different players and sector players from a political point of view, but at the same time work with a party because we need politics through the SG, and but above all, under the office of the president. So it was not an easy job because I had to start running from the word go. There you was were, no sleeping, you, there was no walking. You were a political scientist. Did you foresee a loss in 2021? So I'll put it this way. In, in 2019, when I was engaged as a consultant, I gave a position before the party as a consultant, yes. central committee, that if elections were to be held in 2019, in October, the PF were, would have lost that, that election. That was your paper to the that Central Committee? That was the paper I presented to the Central Committee. I see. It's on record. And the, of course, a lot of Central Committee members are not happy with my position. No, they must have said you are lying. Exactly. Mom, <laughs> <and> the, <laughs> <laughs> Some day, in fact, this is a treasonable statement. How would you make such a presentation before a sitting president? The president was in the meeting. He was chairing the Central Committee, and that was wow. the first time I engaged Central Committee and the president. So I was candid enough to make my expert analysis in 2019, October. What were and the threats to his re-election? Why did you say if elections were held in 2019, he would lose elections? Of course, I, I, it was easy for me because I had done a, a short analysis for almost three to four months. I took into account a lot of strength for the party, mm -hmm. a lot of weaknesses across board, a, a lot of opportunities as well as a, a, you know, a strength, mm -hmm. weaknesses, opportunities mm -hmm. as well as threats. Mm -hmm. So I was only looking into four things. So in order for the party 
to be guaranteed of re-election, the party was supposed to score very high on two things, yeah. on strength and opportunities. Mm -hmm. But the paper I was presenting before Central Committee in October 2019 had very low rank, uh, rankings. rankings on strength and opportunities. It had multiple rankings and uh, scores on weaknesses and, and threats. threats. Mm -hmm. So for me as an expert, it was very easy to make a conclusion that if elections were held in October 2019, the PF was not going to defend power. So it was from that background that even when I was employed in December, going into January 2020, I was supposed to work with the party and government to manage, reduce exactly, and manage <laughs> the increase, increase the strength and, strength. and the opportunities and minimize the weaknesses and the threats. Mm. So from the way to go, the president was very much aware in terms of my position and he was in agreement in as much as other central members of the central committee didn't like my position, the president said, this is on merit. You're not adding or subtracting. Let's work to do the opposite. So from the word go, he was fully informed in terms of what was before us. Mm. And the journey we needed to walk in one year, maybe six months, mm. to change and turn the tables. Yeah. He was such, President Lung is such an objective person, even having worked with him for almost two years. I enjoyed working with him. No, the hallmark is this. As soon as you were appointed, there was a lot of criticism because you are one of those ardent, you are very active on social yes, media. Yes, exactly, exactly. So you were a very ardent yes, critic yes. of the president. And uh, sometimes you choose very stinging words. Yes. And you had stung him several times. Yes. So you, when you say he's a good man, there are very few people that will arise above those issues and just look at the merit. You see, there is a difference. How did you navigate around those issues? There is a difference the between the person you see afar and the person you see after sitting with him one-on-one -on, -one yeah. on the same table. So the person I worked with is a President Lungu I know. Yeah. And that's the President Lungu I can talk about. He's a good person. He's a gentleman. He's a professional person and I said very objective. He's somebody who will agree with you as well as disagree with you and will give reasons. Yeah. And will challenge you even to research further. Mm -hmm. He's a person that you can't even cheat because he's informed. He takes time to read. Mm. So as an academician, I, work, I enjoyed working with such a president because mm. there was no dull moment. And he has got a high sense of humor. If this is a person at some point who would crack jokes yes. and yes. make you laugh, make you feel at home. He is a president who greeted me on a daily basis, not as an individual, but always included my wife and my children. Wow. And he could ask for my children by name. Mm. Mm, wow. So you see, I had a, up to now, I have a family relationship with him. Mm. At some point, people say, your boss. I said, no, he's no longer my boss. Yeah. We, have, we have a family. He's a yeah. father to me. Mm. It's because of the foundation he created when I worked with him. So I find it natural to engage him. I find mm. it very easy. He's somebody who also shocked me when I engaged him the very first time I went to State House because... Yes. He knew about the criticisms. Yeah. Not that he was ignorant, he knew. Mm. But he said, why I have come here is not to criticize me. You have come here to help me and to work for me. Yeah. It's you to make or break it. Mm. We have challenges, some of them you raise them when you're outside there, but these are the challenges we want you to be our to doctor to help prescribe and try to cure them politically. So that honesty, that professionalism, that human heart, is what I think made me to be solid in that office for the period I worked with him and up to now. How to did you find him. his team? How did you find his party? How did you find his ministers? How did you coordinate your work? Because there's an ecosystem. So it's quite difficult sometimes. While you may, may have brilliant ideas, it's quite difficult to you know, navigate that environment. So how did you, how did you do it? Uh, sorry, we had, to, we had to briefly just to. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, our technical people would uh, disturb us a bit. So we, you found an ecosystem, mm. and how did you fit in that ecosystem and begin to persuade them, especially on the project you had, to make President Edgar Lungu electable and this party to return to okay, power? Yeah. So there was, I will be very honest, there was a lot of resistance. 
in the party. At some point, uh, I could find that some people never appreciated the academic approach to politics, the scientific approach, uh, because they also believed in the physical approach. Mm. But uh, over time, we managed to stabilize, though it was not easy. We also had some good cohorts among the party players who yeah. embraced the scientific approach to political management. Mm. So it was a, a, a combination of managing two balances. But I would be honest to mention that the heavier side of it was more of a resistance, yeah. especially at the provincial, this, at, at local level. We had a lot of challenges. But also at the, level, at the level of central committee, some people never embraced the idea of different models. Mm. But because the president, that's what he wanted, many of them with time ended up jumping on the bandwagon and started running with it. Yeah. As you may be aware, science, politics is not just an art. It's also a science. Yes. So you should be able to be in a position to predict what is going to happen in the next six months. And for that to happen, you need to take scientific measures and interventions that will inform you as a political party in terms of what to do in Chama and not what to do in Sorowezi. Mm. In terms of what to do in Livingston and not do it in, in Chinsali. Mm. So you can't take a holistic approach mm. in terms of both political campaign messages or in terms of political engagement because you have to do with different people in different locations with different political dynamics. And for that to happen, you need some form of a scientific approach before you physically go on the ground. So to answer your question, mm. we ended up uh, uh, selling uh, smoothly later on after some turbulences at takeoff at stage. The beginning. Yes, mm. because as I said, a number of people were very much used to the physical side of politics. They practice the art the physical mobilization of people without being, having some form of a scientific information and facts to determine what you are doing and why you are doing it. And its impact. <laughs> exactly, mm -hmm. and its impact, exactly, yeah. This is DJ Mutati exclusive. All right, that's all right for you today, lovely viewers. If you did enjoy the video, please don't forget to leave a comment in the comment section below. Tell me what you think about the video you just watched in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you, lovely viewers. Once again, I go by the name of Mutatim Pondum. I love you. Peace. I gotta go.